On the surface, things here appear to be following their normal pattern. But the truth of the matter is, something unusual is going on in the studio today. Something that never happened before. Here now to tell you about it is Walt Disney. Welcome. I guess you all know this little fella here. It's an old partnership. Mickey and I started out the uh, first time many, many years ago. We've had a lot of our dreams come true. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. That's it, right here. Disneyland, seen from about 2,000 feet in the air and 10 months away. I want to tell you about it because later on in the show, you'll find that Disneyland the place and Disneyland the TV show are all part of the same. Now on a site of uh, 240 acres near the city of Anaheim in Southern California, right about in here, we've begun to build Disneyland the place. We hope that it will be unlike anything else on this earth. A uh, fair, uh, amusement park, an exhibition, a city from the Arabian Nights, metropolis from the future. In fact, a place of hopes and dreams, facts and fancy, all in one. Now, next year, our television show will be coming from this Disneyland. But this year, we want you to see and share with us the experience of building this dream into a reality. Good to have all of you here, and uh, those of you who are watching online, it's good to have you here as well. Um, it's no accident that any of, you, any of us are here. I believe that God has brought us together for, for a plan and a purpose. And, um, I want to start out by just telling you a little story. It was Thanksgiving evening, and uh, I went away for a, an hour or two to go start working, on, working again on my sermon. And uh, so I usually go to Perkins, and Jill said, why don't you take a, a, a tour kind of by Walmart just to see what's going on. This is about 6 in the evening on Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, so I'm, uh, I, I drive down that street, and there is not a street space to park in in Walmart. It's just, and the, the, there's crowds outside. They're parking in the, in the, in the lot of the strip mall across the street to the south of Walmart and not walking but running over to do the door breakdown thing on Thanksgiving Eve and, and all of this for this great vision of a $150 50-inch television. Okay? And that's, that's what was driving people. Um, and I, I, I love this, this video that I just showed you uh, uh, because it's a very different kind of vision that Walt has. And I, I love the opening of it as well. He says, this is, a, this is just the way things normally are around here. We've got something special today. And you've got all these people whacking, on, uh, uh, whacking on, on instruments and making all these crazy noises, kind of like work around here sometimes. That's what happens around here. It's, we just do all kinds of wacky things. We're not even sure why we're doing it most of the time. We just know that it has some greater purpose. And Walt, uh, this was from the very first episode of his very first television show. It was called Walt Disney's Disneyland. So if you, some of you remember maybe growing up in the 60s and seeing uh, the, the wonderful world of Disney, well, this was the, the television show that was before the television show that was before the television show that, that we remember. Uh, and, it, and it's 1954, it's October, and Walt is excited to share with us his vision for something. Now, it's a new vision for us, but it's a very old vision for Walt. It started for him 20 years earlier when his children were young and uh, Saturday in the Disney family was Daddy Day. And so he would take the kids and he would go do things with them and he was always looking for something to do on Daddy Day with his girls. And so one Saturday he's sitting on a park bench and they're sort of in front of him and they're playing on the slides and the merry-go-rounds and all that sort of thing. And Walt gets this idea. Why not build a place where parents and children could have fun together rather than them having their fun and me sitting here on the bench watching. Why not do it together? And that's the beginning of the vision. And it's, you know, it's, it's seeing something. That's what a vision is, seeing something that no one else can see. And seeing something that to everyone else, it looks impossible. 
And Walt gets started on it right away. The year's 1932. He sees that there's 16 acres of land that's right across the street from his studios, and he goes to buy it until the city of Burbank gets wind of what he has in mind for these 16 acres or some kind of a little amusement park thing, and they just put the stop to it. They say, no, it's not happening. And so the vision gets tucked away, but it never really goes away. It never really dies for Walt. It just keeps bubbling up and bubbling up until sometime in the 1950s when uh, the interstate freeways are being built in L.A. And he finds 240 acres right next to the freeways, just a 40-minute drive from downtown Los Angeles. And he buys this property. It's orange groves and walnut trees. <clears throat> and in come the bulldozers and the dust bowl. 5,000 yards of concrete, a million square feet of asphalt for walkways throughout this thing. He builds in the center of this 240 acres, he builds a, a castle with a tower that extends up 80 feet so that wherever you are on the property, you will see that. And there are four different areas. There's a main street. And, you know, in that first show, after that little clip that I just showed you, then he goes and he, he has a scale model of the whole thing. And he walks us through it. He shows us his vision for this thing. And everyone thought he was nuts. The bankers would not loan him money. They hated the idea. He had investors that were already invested in Disney. They were opposed to it. But, of course, he's the major stockholder, so what he says goes. Uh, he's, he's got these contractors that they're out there in this dust bowl. They're knocking down orange trees. It's creating all kinds of dust. And all this is supposed to happen in 10 months. And they're wondering how in the world it's all going to get done. And even his brother Roy, who's a business partner in the Disney Corporation with him, he is sure that the park will probably open on time because that's what Walt does. But within a year, it was going to close and it was going to lead everyone to financial ruin. It gets better than this. Opening day, hottest day of the year in Southern California. It's so hot that the new asphalt gets soft and women in their heels, the heels start punching down into the blacktop. They're making holes. They're getting stuck in the blacktop. They do not have enough soft drinks to go around. There are not enough drinking fountains in this hot day. Some of the rides don't work right. And the best part of all is some guy got hold of a ticket. By the way, do you know what a ticket costs for the first opening day? A dollar. <laughs> okay. Anybody priced Disney tickets lately? <laughs> okay. You guys know where this is going, right? So, uh, so somebody gets hold of, of a $1 ticket and he counterfeits tickets and sells 10,000 of these tickets. There are 10,000 too many people in this overcrowded park with not enough drinking fountains and rides that don't work. It was an unmitigated disaster. <clears throat> and somehow they saw their way through. And you know the rest of the story. And it all started with a vision. Seeing something that no one else could see. And that vision just motivated him to do everything he could to make it a reality so that others would see it and enjoy it and share in that vision with him. Walt said about his park what he wanted was he wanted when people come into the park to not see the world that they live in, but feel like they're in a completely different world all together. And that's what visions do, right? They take us to a different place. They move us in a different direction. They help us to see things that we think are impossible. Let's sing.
So let me say that again. A vision is, is the ability to see something that no one else can see that everyone else thinks is impossible. And, and a, a vision is taking people into a place where they see not the world as it is, but they're taken into a whole other world altogether. And that's kind of what we do in Advent here. This is, this is our first uh, Sunday of the new church year. I know it's, it's not the new year. New year is January 1st. But in, in terms of our, our Jesus calendar, we start just a few weeks before Christmas, sort of ramping up to, uh, to Christmas and the first big story, the first big event in, our, in, in the life of our church. And so we're starting in the book of Isaiah, and of course, uh, Isaiah is also a visionary. He's a prophet. He sees things that other people can't see. And he's living in a place, he, in just a little background, it's about 700 years before Jesus comes along. Uh, so about 2,700 years, you know, before us. And he's living in a place that is just in a time that's just deceptive. Um, God's people, it, on the outside, it looks like everything's hunky-dory, like everything is great. But inside, you start looking a little closer, things are starting to rot a little bit. It's uh, falling apart for God's people. Sort of like my, uh, my, my little silver roadster with the, with the, the rag top. Yeah, my, my friend Mike Carmody, he's preached here a couple times. He calls it a 20-footer. Uh, it really looks good at 20 foot. But you get a little bit closer and you start seeing the dents and the dings and the scratches. And that's kind of what's happening with Judah as well. It looks good at a distance, but you get close and you realize that, oh my, uh, this is not good. You see, they have some neighbors to the north. Uh, it's, it's actually it's their, their cousins. Uh, it's a country called Israel. And a few years before this, a couple hundred years before this, the two countries split and they went their separate ways. And now Israel has become very strong, and God's people, Judah, have become very weak, and Israel's starting to threaten to maybe take them over and take back the land that was once part of theirs. And so in their weakened state, they're not looking towards God. They've sort of left God behind, taken him for granted, forgotten who he is, and they start making decisions based on this threat. And so they form an alliance with the world power of the day, a place called Assyria. And that, of course, leads them to start following Assyrian gods and taking on Assyrian customs and taking themselves further and further away from God. And it would be easy for Isaiah to say, hey, this is the wrong direction and just start passing some judgment on him. He does a little of that. But I want you to notice in this passage how very surprising Isaiah's words are because he doesn't do any of that. Instead, Isaiah has a vision that he wants to share with God's people. He says, you know, God's house, it's not going to come through easy answers and alliances with foreign powers. God's house, it's not God's salvation. Your existence as a people is not going to be assured through Assyria. Instead, God is going to build a mountain right here. It's going to be a towering castle, 80 feet in the sky like Walt Disney. And everyone will see it. It will rise up about, around, among all the hills and all the lands. And they're not going to come to Assyria to experience the God of all salvation. They're going to come here to you in your weakness. And you will be the light to the world. And it will be a light based not on war and not on conquest and not on threat. But my mountain will rise up as a place of peace and hope. And I will use you to accomplish this. And of course, the thing about all of this is this is something that no one else can see. And it looks impossible. They have an army to the north that is threatening to invade. They have made an alliance with a foreign country to stave off this army. That's the reality of the situation. I mean, everyone thinks Isaiah is nuts for passing this off. But here's the thing about a message of hope. A message of hope in times of despair 
drives us. And it changes the course of our lives in ways that we can't dream possible. Some of you know my, one of my favorite movies is Shawshank Redemption. And, and I love the character of Andy because here he is. He's been put in prison for a murder he does not commit. And he's living in prison, living out this life, but he has this hope that someday he's going to get out of there and he's going to go buy a little resort down in Mexico where the ocean is blue and deep and he can forget about all of this. And that's where he will live the rest of his days. And that vision sustains him as he is in this toilet of a prison. And it not only sustains him, but it drives everything he, do, he does so that no one else can see this, but everything that Andy does while he's in prison drives him towards that day. And if he can't get out by legal means, he's going to get out by illegal means. He's going to build tunnels. He's going to take his, he's going to take his wall out one handful at a time and drop it through his pant pocket onto the ground. He just keeps going. Everything he does is driven by something that looks impossible, a vision that no one else can see. And that's the power of Isaiah's words. No one else can see this. All they can see is the threat. All they can see is the war. All they can see is the conquest and the potential bloodshed. And Isaiah says, no. We're not going to get caught in the middle of this, and we, are, and, and we might be weak in worldly ways, but God is going to use us, and they, in the end, are going to be drawn to us because God will use us in the ways of peace, and he will rise up a mountain, and he will sit there on his throne, and all the nations of the world will come here to us. Let's sing. So I'd like to draw your attention to the little graphic that's up there, and I, I apologize for the screens, they bl blinking in and out. You know, um, we're not perfect here by any means. You know, things get messed up all the time, and we don't do it on purpose, so I can tell you about that, but it's, it's just what happens. But, you know, it's not about the toys. It's about what we're doing here. And I, I want you to see this graphic because it's, it's really important. There's a little hashtag along the side. It says, God-powered, spirit-led. Would you say that with me? God-powered, spirit-led. And we're starting a new year, which means that we're, I'm starting sort of a new sermon series or set of sermon series with an overarching theme for the entire year about God empowering us and us being led by the Spirit, us as individuals and us as a, as a congregation called First Lutheran Church. And I, I want us to be thinking in very different ways because as the weeks roll out here in the next two, three weeks, I want to, I want to tell you a little bit about where, where the church is going these days. And what I see is, is the hope for the church. And I believe that this congregation is part of the hope for the church, a big part of the hope for the church. I think we have a mission here that maybe none of us have really dreamed about in the Algona area and in the Kasuth County region. And maybe even further than that, I do not know. But God has put a vision in front of us. And, and so we want to be God-powered. We want to be spirit-led. And you might ask how that happens, and I will tell you that it begins with a relationship with God who has a vision for us. And it's bigger than any vision you could possibly imagine. I mean, back in 1932 when Disney sat on that park bench and watched his kids play and had this idea, I'm certain that he had no idea that in just a few decades... There wouldn't be one park, but there would be six resorts around the world with 12 theme parks. And by the way, in 1955, the word theme and the word park were never used in the same sentence. Did you know that? It happened with Disney. Six resorts around the world, 
12 parks, the largest of which is in this little town down around Florida someplace. And did you know, 40 square miles it sits on. And I'm sure in 1932 he had no idea exactly where that vision would take him. And that's nothing compared to the vision that Isaiah has cast for his people and then later for us. Because I'm certain that when Isaiah is casting his vision, he's thinking about Judah. He's thinking about Assyria. He's thinking about Israel. He's thinking about all the, all the, uh, uh, the, the nations in the region that they're all going to be drawn to him on this mountain. But I'll bet you money that he had no idea whatsoever that 700 years from the time he lived on this earth, there would be a mountain called Calvary. And there would be a throne on that mountain called the cross. And that God would take Isaiah's vision from long ago. And he would set upon that mountain the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Who by his sacrifice draws everyone to him in all times and in all places and in all generations. That's the power of the vision. And it's so big, those who cast it have no idea where God is going to take it and what God has in mind. So God powered, right? And it starts with a relationship with that kind of God for each of us. A relationship with that kind of God who has that kind of vision, not just for the world and not just for this congregation, but for each and every one of you. And then after that, just be open. Watch. Look. And take the gifts and talents that you have. There are so many gifts in this congregation. There are so many talents. And use them not just to serve yourself, but to serve this God who sent his son on a mountain to bring you here to this time and this place. Those visions pop up all over the place. Case in point, this last week we had Thanksgiving dinner here for three-year-old preschool. And uh, I, one, of the, one of the preschool classes, so it was, it was supposed to be Monday at morning, mon Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday afternoon didn't happen because school got canceled, but that's okay. And we, we just set out just to, as a, as a congregation, just to partner up with the school. And so this was our first big event, and I'm, I'm sort of walking around talking to the kids, and I see that there's this one little boy that Joe was working with, actually, and he was so sad. And I went over and I said, what's up? And Joe said, oh, his finger hurts. And I kissed it, but it's not getting any better. And so I went down and I said, let's see it, bud. And I look at his finger, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's no scratch. There's no cut. It's not even red. It looks just like all the other fingers. And, you know, <clears throat> something told me that I shouldn't do what I would normally do, which is say, buck up, buddy, you're going to be okay? Looks good. Just sort of put it off. Instead, I, I, I knelt down beside him and I looked him in the eye and I said, tell me about your hurt. He says, oh, it hurts so bad. He's, I said, I know sometimes, sometimes we all feel that way, don't we? And sometimes it feels like it's our finger, but it's in here. And we talked for about five minutes and I just let him... I sort of went into my inner Mr. Rogers, <laughs> another sermon for another time, and, and I just let him feel it and know that there was somebody else there that felt it with him. And this is not what I would normally do. I don't know what possessed me to do it. But then, at the end of the day, so I moved on after this is all done, and his finger still hurts, but I moved on. We sat down for a picture right over there, and I got on the floor, and this little boy zigzagged around six other little kids 
And he came, and he sat right here, and he curled up into my side and put his hand on my knee, and I put my hand on his. It wasn't just a little boy. It was God sending me a vision of who I'm supposed to be in this world and what I'm supposed to do. Because you see, I have this thing in my life. We all have this thing in our life. It's powered by God. It's a relationship with the one who gave his life for you. And then, after that, just open your eyes. Because God is showing you visions in ordinary things all around. My friends, I do not know where this next year is going to go. I am so excited about it, though. I'm hoping to have conversations with all of you. I'm hoping to have conversations with the church leadership. I'm hoping to be learning and opening ourselves up to prayer so that we can see for ourselves the direction that God has in this life. Not just putting church into autopilot, and not just doing our lives the way we always do our lives. But being taken by a vision to a place we do not expect. And knowing and trusting that that vision will unfold in ways exponentially with power and love and mercy that you and I cannot begin to imagine. And for that we give him thanks and praise. Amen.